Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to Society and the State, episode 143. Let's talk socialism. Dun, dun, dun. Connor here with Brian. Uh, so I had the opportunity to do an op-ed for Fox Business uh, recently, and uh, we will link to that in the show notes page, societyandthestate.com slash 143. And Brian and I want to take a minute to talk, to talk about this because it's definitely a trend. And Brian, let me start by maybe posing a question to you. Do you feel that schools, public schools uh, more specifically, teach socialism? Is, is the problem that they are like espousing the virtues of socialism or is it something a little bit more abstract or different? What's your sense of the problems or the connection perhaps between the, the school, public schools and uh, the, the product, which is these, you know, graduates and high school kids coming out who are embracing this more socialist mentality? There's a time I would have probably taken a much more hard line stance on how the schools are teaching things that promote socialism. In fact, I would have probably said it's a conspiracy, you know, and the, the education unions and whatnot, they're, they're all about getting these young minds while they're young and, uh, and indoctrinating them. I still think that socialism is being taught, but I think it's more of a product of uh, as much as socialism has crept into the American political system, mm -hmm. what the schools are teaching is just a reflection of the very system that funds them and that keeps them going and so it's, I don't know that it's necessarily this nefarious conspiracy, but how can they help but reflect favorably on the system that allows them to exist? Exactly. Uh, Brian, have you ever heard of a school called uh, the Sudbury School? Are you familiar with them at I'm all? I'm not. This was no. started, I believe, in Massachusetts uh, back during the hippie era. It's been around ever since, and now it's been replicated in many other places. Um, and it's really fascinating. This is basically unschooling. It's institutionalized unschooling. So uh, it's like a quasi-private school, basically. Parents send their kids there. There's no curriculum. There's no classes. There's no teachers. There's just some adults there who act as mentors to facilitate whatever the kids want to learn. There's, you know, a kitchen to cook in. There's computers to play video games or to code or to whatever. So they have resources. They have stuff. If the kids wanted to, they could go hang out at the lake all day long, right? But but then, of course, the idea and the unschooling mentality is they're learning all sorts of things just doing that. My point, Brian, is that the people coming out of that environment understand uh, freedom and independence in a way that kids coming out of public school do not. And it's not like Sudbury is teaching independence. They're teaching freedom and self-direction and so forth. It's just inherently intertwined with the nature of the system. Right. Like you when you experience uh, a, a system of freedom, you're going to implicitly understand what that means and probably be more predisposed to support that freedom and that independence on a broad range of other things. So I think that's kind of the antithesis is you get that like freedom model where kids have experienced that. And so they're more likely to support it and want it in other aspects of their lives. And to your point, you know, in the public schools, kids are experiencing this like socialist type system. And so is it any surprise that the output is kids who, you know, think that government is the solution? I'm curious, and this is just a, a quick tangent here. Uh, the Sudbury School, is that associated with uh, Carrie McDonald or is she associated with it? Because I know she just, her book, Unschooling, was just published a couple of weeks ago. So Carrie, um, yeah, she's now a senior education analyst, I think, for the Foundation of Economic Education. We've actually had her on our show uh, a few months back. Carrie's a great person. She does have a brand new book on unschooling, and she does discuss these issues. Uh, she's not affiliated with them, but one person that she does talk about is uh, Peter Gray, uh, who is a psychologist. He's written a phenomenal book I recommend to all parents. In fact, we'll link to this in the show notes page as well, called Free to Learn. And uh, again, this is by Peter Gray. It'll be linked at societyinthestate.com slash 143. And, uh, and, in that book, among many other things, he talks about research that he did on these Sudbury students. So he went and did this longitudinal type study, go out and interview these kids over the years. And okay, kids who are in that environment, um, what do they go on to do? Are they more employees or more entrepreneurs? Are they self-starters? Do they uh, look back favorably upon that experience? What do they think? 
And, uh, and so it's very interesting seeing the analysis that he did of kids who were in that type of environment. And I suspect that if you were to poll those types of kids and see their favorability for socialism, you know, it probably wouldn't even make it into the teens. It'd probably be very low in part because there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's probably some self-selection bias happening where the families who are more likely to go to Sudbury are more likely to be independent minded already. Um, but a lot of these things I think are intertwined. Brian, when I was writing this op-ed, um, the point that you made was one that that um, I thought was very important. And but let me ask a slightly different question. So the, the this didn't make it through the editing process for my own fault because I cut it for length. But one of the points that I wanted to make in this op-ed was, you know, more more uh, more youth, more millennials, more Gen Zs are embracing socialism and they're less supporting capitalism. I fear that part of the problem is not only uh, my main contention in the op-ed, which is they're not being exposed to free market ideas at all in the K through 12 system, but there's another important point I want to get your reaction to. And that is, I think that the, the rising generation has not had a good model of what capitalism is, right? They, they see bank bailouts and they see corporate tax subsidies and revolving doors and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, my fear is that it's, it's tough to defend uh, capitalism when its popular image is is corrupt. What do you think? No, I, I think the, the very meaning of capitalism has been corrupted. Um, I, I asked some people a couple of years ago, how would you define capitalism? And one of the answers was, uh, the laws favor those with capital. And I went, ooh. <laughs> that wasn't what I had in mind, but it's accurate. It, it's it, like the golden rule. He who owns the gold makes the rules, right? Right. So, th yeah, there, the perception of, of what capitalism is definitely has been skewed. And, and I know you prefer the term free markets, or free enterprise in, in place of capitalism, uh, I assume it's probably because it's it's the term has has slipped its meaning a little bit. It's a cleaner term. Yeah. You pointed out though too though in in your um in your uh, piece in in Fox Business, it's trendy too. What the kids are doing, you know, the Che Guevara shirts. Yeah. Hey, look at me. You know, aren't I a trendsetter? Right. They have no concept though. There's no historical concept for who exactly was this guy and what was it that made him famous. And and that I think is where the public schools are to blame is the lack of exposure. And one of the things I talk about is that, is it any wonder that um, the system is the way it is and the results are the way they are when those who are in charge of this education establishment are very left leaning, they're very supportive of you know, socialism slash quasi communism and all sorts of things. And among um, one, among other examples, there was one that I cited, this analysis that was done of over 8,000 college professors. So here we're not talking high school, although you have a lot of the same issues there. This particular analysis was of college professors at liberal arts colleges around the country, over 8,000 professors. This was very detailed, very comprehensive. They found 78.2% of the academic departments that were in this survey, the 8,000 plus professors, had either no Republicans at all, or they say so few as to make no difference. And so my question is like, Brian, let's you know say Bob has a kid graduating high school, he's gonna go to college, and you know Bob's kid is, has been raised to be somewhat conservative, but you know not political, he does, never read any of these like classical books and doesn't really get the issues very deeply sends them off to college because that's what you do and you got to get a good job. So go to college. Um, wh what do you suppose is, is the likelihood that Bob's kid is exposed to um, ideas that favor uh, individual rights, free markets, uh, limited government uh, in a system in which leftists and liberals and progressives are the gatekeepers and the ones who are you know, requiring the curriculum and requiring the reading and requiring certain tests and questions and so forth. I, I just don't see much hope for Bob's kid in that environment. Well, and Bob's kid is a captive audience, a fact which I'm sure is not lost on, on those uh, educators who may have those. Uh, Elaborate what you mean by that. What do you mean? So, okay, I'm going to put myself in the shoes. If I, if I were an educator and I knew that I had this captive audience of people who had to listen and, and, and maybe even they kind of have to agree with what I'm saying if they want to get a good grade, yeah. wink, wink. Um, I would take advantage of it most likely. And, and so I'm, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm saying that's kind of human nature. To preach, basically. To, to, to preach to, to them. convert them. And, and I, I would back that up with the observation that um, I had a friend who went back to college a few years ago. Okay. And he said one of the hardest things for him, because he was older, had a little more experience, he has kids and everything. One of the professors got up in class and actually made the comment, my job here 
is to make sure that whatever beliefs you brought with you into this classroom are stripped away. And I'm going to, I'm going to teach you to disbelieve the things that your parents have worked all their lives to teach you. And he was very open about it. Wow. And, and my friend was pretty shocked and actually a little bit angry, came back and says, you know what? People are paying money, not knowing that their kid is being sent there in this case. And I'm not saying every professor is like that, but this one professor was very open about how he would use his position to be an activist, to game the system for the sake of espousing and teaching and pushing his own ideology. And I, you know, as you point out, Brian, that's kind of human nature. We, we, we can't not expect that a professor is going to discuss concepts that are favorable to what he believes that he's got bias. Even if he tries to think that he's neutral, often he's not going to be. So, so it's human nature. So maybe that's okay. We send the kid to college and we'll have different professors uh, preaching different things, but that's the problem when you have this political homogeneity, right? Like mm-hmm. they're, everyone's kind of leftist, you know, you'll get the preachy stuff, but you'll also get a lack of exposure. Uh, part of my concern, and this bleeds into K through 12, when we're talking about socialism is this kind of implicit assumption that government is the solution to our problems and teachers are not exposing their children to historical information that would maybe contextualize that that kind of sentiment a little bit more and say, well, like, look, this has happened in this other country. This happened in America, you know, 100 years ago. That type of information that would qualify uh, that claim is often, you know, so we're, we're, it's often omitted. So we're talking about sins of commission, where you get the preachy professor who's like trying to push on you his ideas. And that totally happens. The activist. You get the activist. So that's the sin of commission. I think more likely, and, or excuse me, more often what's happening is the sins of omission, where kids are being put through, there's this kind of soft uh, assumption and, uh, and bias that, hey, you know, we need more government and more programs to help more people. And that's never really challenged due to omission, because teachers are not, they're doing a disservice to their students by not providing them the other side of the argument, the kind of free market side that, oh, hey, look, throughout history, the most people have been helped through, you know, capitalist systems where upward mobility is uh, helped through, you know, like everyone has a cell phone now in Africa and, you know, refrigerators and the, the free market system or, or, you know, free-ish market system has done more to liberate and empower humanity than any government program ever has. But how often are you going to hear an activist professor in college say that? I think very rarely. Yeah, it's... I, I think the the answer is something that you have actively been addressing for a number of years now, uh, and that is uh, the kids need to be exposed to these lessons or these concepts at a much earlier age. You know, the Tuttle Twins, which, uh, I, how many how many volumes do you have now? Uh, we're just about to publish our 10th book. Okay, I, I knew we were getting close to 10 yeah. there. Um, but what a great way to reach out. And the kids that you're targeting, you're not talking about college students here. Right. You're talking as young as five years old. Right. Well, and that's just the thing, too, is like, by the time they get to college, they've already been through, you know, 12 odd years of, of this type of indoctrination, for lack of a better word. And, uh, you know, the, the example I try and think of is like, imagine we're in an orchard and we've got all these like sick disease trees around and we're trying to fertilize them back to good health. That's you and I trying to educate adults. We're trying to correct their ways and know here's the truth and here's the the, the right thing and read this book and, and watch this video. We're trying to fertilize these diseased trees. And that's all well and good. We got to save the trees, right? But any good gardener uh, managing an orchard is looking to the seeds and saplings and saying, how can I avoid that same disease? How can I avoid that rot? It, it's very expensive to buy bucket loads of fertilizer. It takes a lot of time to restore a tree to good health. Many of them die because of not because of the disease in our example it's not like if you believe socialism you're going to die so not if you believe it hard enough and embrace it hard enough (laughs) though a lot of people have died there you go (laughs) um but you know we got to be focused on the the seeds and the saplings we got to be forward thinking and that is my concern with doing projects like the tunnel twins brian is as i've looked around there's so many people who are trying to educate adults very important right let's use that fertilizer but man how many people in the kind of broader freedom movement per se are thinking about the rising generation. We've basically abandoned the rising generation to the enemy, if I can just broadly use that term, the opposition, right? Uh, the left-leaning uh, educational establishment. And and we've basically resigned ourselves to the fact that they get the first, you know, 20 years, 25 years, and then we'll start talking to those kids, those young adults. Like, 
we're losing. We're forever going to be losing if we are letting this system uh, indoctrinate these kids this way. So I, I think we need more efforts, more competition, more, uh, you know, propaganda from a free market perspective for, for the rising generation. Something I've seen you do, which I think has been extremely effective, and, and we'll know for sure, you know, years from now, we'll see the kind of fruit that it bears, but your efforts to reach to that younger generation through the Tuttle Twins is is just one facet of how how it's done. I mean, that's theoretical. Just like sitting in a classroom and hearing about, you know, the, the things that the, the professor is espousing is largely theoretical. But when it becomes applied, that's a whole different thing. And so like the children's entrepreneur markets that, that you sponsor each year, there's a chance for kids to, to get a, a taste of free market principles in their own way, and yet they're they're actually doing it. And it's far different from, you know, someone telling them, well, you know, people who make money are all evil and it's all just self-interest. Kids who have been a part of one of those markets are like, no, it's, it's serving my self-interest, but I'm doing that because I'm meeting another person's need. I'm creating value for them right. and they can recognize. It wasn't just a gimme where I'm taking everybody's money. You were creating value and you were being rewarded for it. And that's kind of at the heart of, of what they need to understand to understand what capitalism really is. Totally. I think entrepreneurship is the antidote to socialism. When people have the profit motive and they realize that um, that entrepreneurship is service, it is how we help humanity, and there's a mutual exchange of value that happens. Um, for those in other states uh, outside of, so in Utah, it's the children's entrepreneur market, which you can look up on social media. Um, in other states, uh, I would recommend that you look at the Acton uh, Business Fair. Um, they do, in many other states, a similar uh, type of markets. They're, they're a lot of fun. It's a good idea. And yeah, these are the types of ideas I think we need. We need to be doing more of this to educate the rising generation. Otherwise, we end up with the result we have today. I cited this in the op-ed, but here's the statistics. According to a recent poll, 49.6% of young Americans, so basically half, share this uh, view. They agree with this statement. I prefer living in a socialist country. Half of young adults, right? Uh, 61% of 18 to 24-year-olds have a favorable reaction to socialism generally. This was a part of a poll where they said, you know, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of X and Y and Z? And when they said socialism, 61% of 18 to 24-year-olds. And, you know, the thing is, I'm very confident if you took these young Americans, you sat them down and you gave them a history lesson and you really explain the truth of things, they'd be like, oh, no, we don't want that. But I think very often, again, like their notion of capitalism is corruption and old white guys that are enriching themselves um, at the expense of others. And their idea of socialism is, you know, what? Uh, rainbows everything is and fair. Everything is fair. We're helping people. The, the little guy is being looked out for. Right but they lack the contextual understanding of what socialism actually means. And, and maybe that's, you know, a positive thing for us is, okay, sure. Just like you point out, Brian, they're wearing, wearing the Che Guevara uh, shirts. Sure. That's fashionable to say that you support socialism, but when it really came down to it, maybe, you know, they wouldn't go so far. Although in the same poll, and I didn't cite this when they started asking people, do you support like healthcare for all and free college just through the roof, the support, even among demographics that did not have a majority favorable view of socialism. They're like, oh yeah, but we support healthcare for all. And so even if people don't like the term, they often like the policies. And that's, that's one of the key distinctions that I have seen that spells opportunity. I used to work with a young lady who was a diehard Bernie Sanders fan, and she's really a good person. And, and we would have a lot of conversations, especially during the 2016 election. We talked about, you know, the, the benefits or the attributes that Bernie embodied that, that made her, you know, resonate with him. It all came down to compassion. Yeah. She saw real problems and she saw people who needed help. And then at that point, you know, I was doing what I could to open her mind to, I agree with you. There, there, is, there are opportunities for compassion to be exercised, but the means by which we do it are as important as the fact that we're doing something about it. If we, if we try to do compassion by coercion, there are some unintended consequences that come along with that in the loss of property rights, personal freedom, and just being absorbed into the collective. Whereas mm -hmm. if, if we can, can do compassionate things without, you know, government's boot resting on our neck, the compassionate thing is still being done, but it's being done for the right reason. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully we can persuade those people by having more voluntary efforts of charity to show that, you know, we're not just saying no to the government. We're saying yes to these voluntary charitable methods to actually help because then we can, 
sympathize and build on a common ground and say, yeah, I'm compassionate as well. I want to help. Hey, let's do a project together. Let's try and come up with a way to, to help. But I, I find that very often these people who claim their compassion are are lazily compassionate. They, they want other people to be helped, but they don't want to do anything about it. Outsourced compassion, which is unfortunately very easy. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a product of uh, money's taken from our paychecks through withholding that we don't even miss it. And we assume, well, you know, the government's doing so. There's a program to help these people. Right. And so we may not switch our conscience totally off, but we at least flip it to standby mode, which is kind of the same thing. Yep. Guys, super important issue, especially for those of you who have kids, to be contemplating the ways in which the rising generation are being exposed either to harmful ideas or being put through systems that are very favorable towards, you know, socialism and big government and government is the solution. It's something I think that parents need to be thinking about more often because often these messages are soft and infrequent and, as Brian points out, wrapped in, you know, compassion and and over time, you get that drip, 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 and you end up with, you know, an ocean of, of bad ideas that lead to uh, 61% of young Americans saying they have a favorable view of socialism. So we clearly have work to do. Check out the links uh, we mentioned on the show notes page, societyandthestate.com slash 143. Stick around for next time. Make sure you're subscribed, and we will see you then. You've been listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.